Hey, I'm, I'm sitting here at the, uh, getting ready to get on my shuttle. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm ready. I'm ready. You're, you're sitting, <laughs> you're, you're at the airport, not in a cab. Yeah, no, I'm in the, at the dollar rent a car, turn into my car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice. Yeah, I just pulled up. Yeah, that's all right. pandemonium this morning. Yeah, so so if, no, you, have to, all good. if you have to go, let us know. But uh, I just wanted to. No, no, no. I'm I'm good. I'm okay, gonna, right. You know, I mean, I mean, there may be some background noise when I get up on the shuttle or something. Sure, sure. So, so you know, yeah. we've had a lot of talks over this past day about amniotic membranes. Um, uh huh. You know, Blythe Medical, the makers of the Arrow uh, membrane, they're actually one of the sponsors of the conference. So we've had a a huge number of people coming on the show and talking to us about it. And you know, I know that that you were speaking about it too. And uh, you do more membranes than I think anybody I know. <laughs> I think that's safe you to were, say. I do a lot. We've, we've called you the father of the amniotic membrane for optometry. So, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you just give, give the the novices here? That would, it may even be a new term for some of the for some of our listeners. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about the amniotic membrane and what is what is it, and when do you use it? Well, what it is is a piece of tissue uh, coming from the, the placenta you know, of some lady just giving childbirth. And, and the way you think about it really is it's an a impregnated dressing. Uh, it's, it's used as a bandage, and you put the tissue on the ocular surface. The tissue has all sorts of bioactive components or compounds in it, a bunch of chemicals. And once the membrane is in contact with the ocular surface, it starts to degrade or absorb or resorb, whatever term you want to use. And as that happens, the chemicals are released onto the ocular surface. The chemicals are mostly signaling molecules, and they target the immune system and make the immune system do stuff that it would ordinarily not do. Uh, so if the body's trying to heal a wound, the, the, the chemicals will accelerate that process. So it kind of... It, it, kind of puts everything in a fast forward mode Got it. Uh, so that the, that's how you think about it that's what it is not how you think about it that's what it is uh, it's, it's just like these new band-aids where they put antibiotic in the band-aid mm -hmm. and then you put the band-aid on and it's already got the medicine in it well the, the tissue is the band-aid and the the medicine is in it uh, that's what's going on right does that make sense so, so, so is there anyone type of person with a physical illness where it would be contraindicated just systemically where you we wouldn't want to yes and, yes and no they're, they're, I've never disqualified a person based on their, their physical status or their history but I now stratify patients into two categories a, a low risk group and a high risk group there's always some risk involved in any procedure so there is no no risk group so it's either low risk or high risk. Mm. Uh, the high risk group, I sometimes pre-treat them now uh, with a, a week of steroids, trying to calm it down before I put the membrane on. Uh, but, you know, there would be no one I would disqualify. The people that would be high risk are people that are real sick. That's what, you know, I'm, I'm going anecdotally. I mean, I don't have any peer-reviewed studies or anything, but I've done over 300 patients in the past year, so I've seen it. So this is based on my clinical experience and some study. There are some uh, references to these type things in the literature, but it's hard to find, and there's not a bunch of references. But there, there, there are uh, references talking about people that have had uh, persistent bouts of uveitis, uh, some type of, of uh, systemic disease like sarcoid and lupus, the autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the people that you want to treat, so you're not going to disqualify them. But like everything else, there's different levels of intensity or severity. And someone could have lupus and it could be totally controlled when they got no symptoms. And someone could have lupus where they're almost near death. Yep. Uh, the ones that are near death probably are going to have a higher rate of, of post-operative complications. That's what I've seen. Sure. So if I've got some 70, 80-year-old lady barely making it, coming in on a walker, she's got, you know, she brings in her list of medicine that's typed up. Okay, <laughs> you know, that's always yeah. a clue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the oxygen tube in the nose, the whole bit. Yeah, she's 50-50. You know, she, she's, I'm still trying her. But, you know, she's going to have a higher rate of, of any kind of post-operative complication than other groups of people. So, again, back to the original question, is there somebody I'd say no to? The answer is no. Uh, are there people that have a higher risk of not having the thing work or having a problem? The answer is yes. Right. 
So I guess, you know, you, you fit on average now, I guess, more than one a day over the past year. What are sort of so, some of the indications uh, for, for using the memory? My, my most common indication is, is moderately severe or severe dry eye. Mm. Uh, that's probably 45, 50 percent of the patients that I put the, the membrane on. Uh, so these are patients uh, classically with, you know, severe uh, damage that can be revealed with lysamine green or, or fluorescein stains. So you're going to see stuff wrong with them. Uh, generally, people that have had severe dry eye for a number of years, uh, generally people you've tried kind of standard or, or uh, regular treatments on, it, you know, for stasis, Zydra, collagen floods, bandage contacts, unpreserved tears, whatever it may be. So, so it's generally people that have been worked on uh, and, you know, they're still needing help. Well, I've got a bunch of those patients just like everybody else, and, and that's probably my, my biggest, well, no, probably, that's my biggest group. The second biggest group for me is people with anterior basement membrane dystrophy. I have quite a few people like that, several dozen, where it's clinically significant. They have erosions all the time. It affects their vision. You know, it's a bad problem. Uh, that's my number two group. I've done dozens and dozens and dozens of patients like that. Uh, the, the, the protocol is a little different because on those patients, you want to go ahead and, and try to kind of gently debride all the bad epithelium out and and if you can, kind of rub the basement membrane with a sponge or maybe an algebra brush trying to smooth that stuff out before you put the membrane on because you want the membrane to help the epithelium grow back as a, as a unit. If you don't kind of work on the basement membrane, then it doesn't really help them that much. And it, it took me several patients to figure that out. Uh, but that's my number two group is, is epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. And it, it works real well on most of those people. Uh, I, there's all, I mean, I probably had... 12, 15 different diagnosis codes I've used. Uh, filamentary keratitis, recurrent corneal erosion, uh, thermal burns, chemical burns, uh, abrasions, injuries. Uh, I've, I've done uh, corneal ulcers, herpetic lesions. I've done a few people kind of almost, you know, I'm almost kind of experimenting on some folks where I've tried everything and nothing seems to work. I had a patient two weeks ago with chronic hyperlacrimation, just this excessive watering of the eyes. And I, I'd probably worked on this person two years, trying everything, you know, I, I flushed the nasal lacrimal drainage system, put them on steroids, put them on restasis, put, put them on this, put them on that, probed them out, nothing worked. You know, just consistent, chronic, excessive watering of the eyes. I put fluorescein in, put lysamine green in, you don't see a thing. Hmm. Uh, the, the, there's no ocular surface damage that you can see uh, with the slit lamp other than tears streaming down the person's eyes. And you would say, well, how does the amniotic membrane affect that? Well, honestly, I don't know. I know I've done four or five people like that, and it seems to help a lot of times. Uh, you know, that these things, you know, they're complicated. It's hard to really say, you know, how they work sometimes. It's, it's you know, it's, they're almost like firecrackers. You know, where I'm, I'm, I've got a, a load of chemicals I'm going to put on the ocular surface. You know, eight times out of ten, it's going to help. Uh, two times out of ten, it might not. Right. Uh, it's kind of a, a roll of the dice and a little bit of luck, a kind of luck of the draw. But, you know, if I've got something that's 80, 85 percent successful, yeah, that's worth giving it a try to me. Sure. And, uh, and the part, you know, where it's, where it's 15 or 20 percent not successful, then I'll do something else. And so is that actually what you're seeing with outcomes like in dry eye? Are you seeing about 80 or 85 percent success? Give or take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, not, I, I mean I, anecdotally, I could just ooh and ah, uh, <laughs> you know, these things do. And most of the doctors that have, have done this procedure would see the same thing. Uh, I know Dr. Silverberg's had some great results. I've talked with him. Almost everybody that has tried these things has had great results because they work most of the time. And, and again, sometimes it's incredible uh, where, where you have patients with long-term chronic stuff you put these membranes on them, and like three days, it's gone. Hmm. You know, stuff that you were working on for, for a year. Right. Uh, it, it's really, really marvelous sometimes. Can, sometimes can we, it's not. Can we get back to, to dry eyes? Because probably that, that would be the most common thing that the average optometrist uh, uh, sees in practice. Uh, do, do you, it, uh, usually dry eyes, I, I assume, are, are, are binocular in nature. So do you... Oh, most fit? of the time, and, and most of the time, the presentation is fairly symmetrical. So do you... Do you fit one 
one eye and then make sure that's healed and then go to the second eye? Is that the way you Good. It yes. Ex- excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, most of the time, probably 97, 98% of the time, you're going to treat one eye at a time. Uh, you know, you're going to see if you get an improvement, see if you get the results you want. And then within a week or so, I'll go ahead and ride. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've done a few patients, you know, bilateral procedure. Where I put membranes on both eyes the same day. Uh, but that's, I could probably count them on two hands. Uh, so most of the time you treat one, then the other. What I found is that, especially in the beginning, you know, approximately a year ago when I got into it, patients would ask me, well, doc, you know, they'd come back, we would do the one eye, it would get better. We'd do the other eye, it would get better. You know, and they would say, well, okay, am I cured? You know, how, how long is this going to last? And I would, you know, in the beginning, I, I got caught off guard. And I would say, well, I, I don't know, really. Uh, you know, I, you're, you're my 12th patient. I don't know, <laughs> you know. Uh, gee, let's figure it out. And, and so I started having patients come back one month after the last procedure. So we would treat them, get them better. They would say they're better. They look better. And I'd say, hey, all right, let's, let's see how long the effect lasts. That's the way that I put it to them. Because uh, so, I don't know. And, and, you know, we'll figure it out. Come back in a month and we'll reevaluate. So I started having everybody come back in a month. Uh, the vast majority of patients were still better at a one-month follow-up. Uh, I'd say practically everybody. Uh, then, in the beginning, again, this is now a year ago, you know, nine months ago. But then I say, well, look, let's keep going. And I'd have them come back for a two-month follow-up. And they'd come back two months after the last procedure. And most of those patients were still happy. They were still better than they were. Uh, it had not regressed yet uh, if it was going to, and everybody, it all looked good. After that, and I started seeing that for most patients, then I just said after two months, well, and actually I stopped doing it, uh, I mean, that was probably the last half of the year, but I would do the one month, do the two months, and if they were good at two months, I would cut them loose and put them back on whatever regular follow-up schedule they had prior to us doing the procedure. Uh, so if it was some glaucoma patient on a, a four-month follow up I said okay hey come back in four months we're done with this uh, so so I put after the second month visit I put everybody back on their re- regular follow up and now I hardly ever do the second month visit to be honest with you I just I check them in a month after the last procedure if it's all good I cut them loose to whatever regular follow up they were going to have some people you know I've, I've done 300 I did 300 last year some people you, you know one treatment and then they're done I mean I haven't seen them since they're fine uh, you know, it could be some 40-year-old lady coming in on her VSP, and I only see her once a year. I may have treated her nine months ago. I haven't seen her since. But I'm assuming she's okay. Uh, so, so you know, the, the, it varies, but it seems to last months for most people. I have had a group where it seems like at about a four- or five-month clip, they started kind of getting symptoms and signs again. Mm. Uh, and, and I've retreated. A number of people, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so, I, you know, I'd, if I had to guess just anecdotally, you know, four to six months maybe, you know, it seems mm-hmm. to last. Uh, and then you can treat them again if you need to. Uh, you know, I've done some people twice. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a handful of people I've done three times. Uh, I've got a small handful I've done four times. Uh, so I could, I could see in, in real severe conditions. I mean, I've got some patients that are severe. I mean, where it's... You know, it's almost like a migraine headache patient where they're suicidal. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got people with dry eyes where, you know, it affects their life. Uh, you know, they can't do stuff. They can't function. Uh, they can't watch TV. They can't drive. They're always in pain. They're always photophobic. I mean, those people exist. Uh, and they seem to find me somehow. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's good for me and good for them. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, people like that, okay, one treatment, probably not going to get it. People like that, I may have to treat them once every three months. Uh, I don't care. They don't either if it works. Uh, so everybody is different. But most people, it seems to last a while. Right. Now, what, one other question I have, because I'm going back to my, the olden days when I, uh, while I was still in practice, I used to get a whole bunch of people in that had uh, messed up corneas, but all of them were using some sort of chemical solutions in their eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so basically you have people coming in with dry eyes uh, that are using all sorts of potions, whatever the, fav- <laughs> the favorite recipe is for, for that particular uh, person. Do you have them eliminate everything before you begin the treatment? 
And then let Usually, the eye go back to yeah, a baseline. Then, exactly. By then, it's not working. Uh, almost by definition, if I'm considering this procedure, all of those potions and elixirs were not getting the job done. Uh, and as you already figured out from your years of practice, you know, that uh, you can have that medical mentosa phenomenon and all the toxic stuff from the chemicals and the preservatives. Uh, you know, that you got to stop all of that. When I put the membrane on, all I do is unpreserved artificial tears two to three times a day. Mm-hmm. Boy, it's no antibiotics, no nothing. So, so uh, I don't want to mess with the immune system. So you, you can start them immediately. Uh, even you don't say, well, t- take a week off of the t- or, or a week off and, and not put anything in your eye, and then I'll see you, or you can, yeah. can start them immediately. I, I wash out period. Uh, you know, I. I, I it's a good question. I haven't really thought about it too much like that. Uh, you know, they get, so I think, no, I don't. I, I don't get them ready, so to speak. Uh, the only getting them ready I might do is on the high-risk patient. If they're not taking a, a steroid, I might kind of try to quiet the eye down for a week uh, before I do it. I've learned that from some of my cataracts, or they started doing that. Uh, so that I'll do that, but no, not, I don't do a washout. That's a good question. I, I've never thought about it. I don't think, I don't think it's necessary. Right, uh, right. You know, they're good, they're going to work or they're not. Right. Uh, kind of. So, so when well, when would you not use the membrane as a first choice? Uh, the amniotic band. In other words, uh, do you, would you put a, a bandage contact lens on a person before uh, trying the amniotic membrane, or would the amniotic membrane be the first choice for most of these things now that you're comfortable with it? I, I I'm actually, you know, going towards amniotic membrane. Uh, maybe not as the first option, but I definitely do not usually go through some long, prolonged stair step approach where I'm dragging the thing out for weeks, you know, going one at a time. Most of my patients I've seen all before, you know, I mean, I've been practicing 33 years. So most of them, uh, I've already tried all that stuff. Uh, if it were a new patient, uh, I'll give you one of my best patients. Uh, this is a lady I've done seven times. Uh, in 12 months. I mean, this is one of those suicidal dry eyes. So say I saw that patient on Monday. She didn't have a um, I'd probably mess with her for a week or so before putting the membrane on. I might put her on Lodamax gel, you know, for, you know, something. Uh, sometimes I'll put patients on a bandage contact lens for a few days before I put the, the actual membrane on just to see how they do with wearing the contact lens. You're going to get some benefit from bandage contacts, but I've, I've, I've already seen so many patients where I tried bandage contacts. I did not get the desired effect, and I put the membrane on with a bandage contact lens on top of it, and it's a totally different response. Hmm. So you do get some benefit, clearly, from, from mechanical cover. Uh, you guys may remember, you know, during the year, I, I had a couple of posts talking about bandage contact lenses. I mean, I think I, I did 150 bandage contact lenses last year. I mean, I try bandage contacts all the time, but this is better for most people. It's, it's a lot better. So, so now the big elephant in the room, the, the economics. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's, it's expensive. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you manage a patient that uh, has to come back and have these things done to, on a periodic basis as far as fees are concerned? Well, well, for you know, my everybody's practice is different. Uh, my practice is, is heavily medical and heavily insurance. Uh, my business is over ninety percent insurance. Uh, if you go by AOA stats from several years ago, I think the average optometrist uh, practice was seventy six percent insurance. Huh. So the days of somebody coming in and spending the thousand dollars for an exam or a workup and pulling out a credit card or cash in my practice are, are almost over. Uh, so whatever insurance paid for the initial procedure is paying for the follow-up and paying for the next follow-up and paying for an additional, you know, that I don't, it's not a problem. Right. Uh, I have talked to several doctors around the country, uh, that are in different, different geographic areas where people have more money and, and there's less insurance. And I, I know quite a few doctors that simply charge the fee and the patient simply pay the fee. Uh, just like I do when I go to the dentist or other things. Uh, if you're really uncomfortable and if your eyes are really messed up, uh, you will pay a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars or fifteen hundred dollars or whatever it takes to try to help you. Just like if you had a, a dental abscess and you, and the guy was getting ready to you know take twelve hundred dollars from you to fix your tooth. Uh, if you're in pain and you can't eat, you're going to pay twelve hundred dollars. 
Yep. Uh, if you're in pain and you can't see, you're going to pay $1,200. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I have seen. So I haven't seen where it's a problem uh, financially. So that, that part's not a big deal at all, uh, really. Uh, it, it, it may be for other doctors, but I certainly haven't noticed it. And the dozens and dozens of doctors that I communicate regularly uh, about this topic, uh, I can't think really of one time that it's come up. To be so, honest with you. So, so basically, uh, the uh, the medical insurance carrier would would pay for multiple uh, oh, exposures yes, absolutely. To, to it. So, so they, sure. they if you can get oh, yeah, four four sure. a year, and they'll they'll pay for the four. Uh, yeah, don't mean nothing. I've never I have never had one thing rejected, no. not one, hmm. ever. That sounds no sounds visits, like no Medicare procedures, no days nothing. With contact lenses, I hmm. I remember when we had a fake patients in uh, before implants. Uh, Medicare was very, very generous, and we could pay, we go two, three, four uh, contact. In those days, were hard lenses a year. But then they wised up, and they said, uh-uh, the most that we will cover well, that's, is that's two still, a year. No, no, that's still there. So if they're mm-hmm. aphakic, the, the benefit is unlimited, and it's lifetime. You can get a contact lens every day if they need it. Right. If they're pseudo-fakic with an implant, it's once per lifetime. Right. So, so it's the same concept. If, if it's reasonable and medically necessary, then there's absolutely no problem. And, and the analogy I always give, and everybody understands it immediately, is the, the, us dealing with our patients with macular degeneration. Uh, many of us have, have you know, patients that have had wet macular degeneration. We refer them to the retina specialist. Get the, they get these $2,200 Lucidus injections every single month. Uh, I, I have had one patient that had 25 injections, and she's got hand motion vision. Oh. And this guy's giving her twenty five for twenty two hundred dollars injection every month to try to maintain that hand motion vision in the bad eye. Wow, that's crazy. I'm like, I'm that. But once I see that, okay, and, and that's how our system is. Okay, then that's how our system is. Yep. And if the, if the retina guy thinks it's reasonable and medically necessary, does. If the optometrist thinks it's reasonable and medically necessary, that's what he or she does. Yep. And and we shouldn't be practicing under a lesser or different set of guidelines or rules or mentality, uh, there's simply no problem with doing the procedure more than once if it is necessary. Right. All right. Well, Craig, we're just about out of time here. If you had to just give one piece of advice for people who are, haven't done this yet, there might be a little reticent, what would you say to someone who's, who's just getting started? Do one. You've got to get, you get started. Mm-hmm. It's better for you. It's better for your patients. You've got to try it. You can't ignore new technology. It's not right. It's not what we're about. Uh, you know, there's the, you, you got to try it. Uh, and if you don't try it, then refer them to a friend of yours that will. Uh, Is there any sort of wet lab that, that they could take courses? I, I haven't seen anything around yet uh, where you can take just a, a few practitioners and, and be with the master well, uh, and try these okay, things now, I don't, I don't want. I don't want to get... Uh, Prepare, I don't know how to, I don't, I'm jealous of this. No, you can uh, do it. You can do a uh, plug. I, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, can I do a plug? Among friends, absolutely. Okay, all right. All right. So I am going, just like you guys, uh, my, my first eye care group is going into the CE business, hmm. and we are having our first ocular surface disease symposium in Scottsdale, Arizona on February 25th, hmm. where we're going to concentrate on modern diagnosis and treatment options for ocular surface disease. And we're going to present all of the options. The workshops and seminars that have been available for the past year, two years, have almost entirely been focused on the cryopreserved dehydrated, uh, cryopreserved amic membranes. Okay. And it's a totally different insertion and removal procedure. It's, it's, it is totally different. And there has been little to no uh, 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 exposure to the dehydrated membranes, putting them on, taking them off. And then it's a weakness right now where some guys don't know how to do it. Right. There's videos to, to watch be done, but that's not the same. It's just not. Uh, and a workshop where you can actually open the thing up, put it on a live human being, watch, you know, kind of watch one, do one, teach one. Well, you can't do that on a video. So we're going to do that in our workshop. And we're going we're gonna to do dehydrated animal membranes. We're not going to do cryopreserve. There's 15 places around the country now. You go to any Vision Expo, they're going to do a – Preserve workshop, and there's all sorts of great. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, we're have a, a one day, all day symposium, five hours of real CE, 
Uh, I'm going to be one of the speakers. Dr. Clark Newman is going to be one of the speakers. Dr. Paula Newsom is going to be one of the speakers. And we're going to teach people how to do this stuff properly. Cool. All right. Well, you know what? We're going to have this little interview that we just did with you up on ODYR real soon. And if you want to post all the okay. information about the conference, feel free. We're going to have a discussion thread right beneath it. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, we appreciate you coming on and doing this from the good, car. Good. The sound the sound was great. Yeah, it worked fine. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, thanks right, so much deal. for your time. <laughs> it was, You're welcome. It was You're wonderful. welcome. I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Catch you okay. later. Bye now.